And good afternoon to all of you kings and priests. <laughs> Is that something? All of you are kings and priests to God. And you're the sons and daughters of the Most High God. Think about that. You might like to tell someone that uh, in your neighborhood or maybe even your church. Just lean over to them and say, Say, I would like to share with you that I am a son of God. And if they raise their eyebrow, you know you'll have to elaborate. But that is actually the case. This is the uh, festival of the glory of the New Covenant. Or the New Testament. Both are meaning the same thing. Of all the mighty acts that God has done, and he has done many, none excel that of the New Covenant. It stands as a mighty example of what God can do and who God is and what he desires and how effective he is. Amen. The new covenant has engaged the minds of the most astute of our race. And yet the simplest of our race have enjoyed the benefits of the new covenant. Here in the new covenant, God is understood to a greater extent than in any other thing he has done. More of God is seen in the new covenant than is seen anywhere else. More of God's heart beats in the new covenant. You get a glimpse of who God is and what he's all about and how he feels about people and what he's done about it. You see God. It's his covenant. And it's a new covenant in every sense of the word. The new covenant is precisely that, a new covenant. There has never been anything like it. And it is something we share today. In the fullest sense of the word, the new covenant is a better testament or a better covenant. It's better than anything else that has ever been given. It's better than the covenant he made with Noah. It's better than the covenant he made with Israel. It's better than anything else he has ever done. It's an eternal covenant. And has eternal ramifications. It stretches from eternity to eternity. And it's saturated with God and Christ and the Spirit and holy angels. The new covenant of God has solicited the active involvement of the Father. The active involvement of the Son. The active involvement of the Spirit. And the inquiry and ministry of holy angels. There is nothing else in all the universe that has engaged such a tremendous segment of heaven. As this. Heaven is interested in the new covenant. And so am I by the grace of God. Every place the new covenant or new testament is mentioned in scripture. Something of pivotal interest is mentioned. It is never mentioned casually. It is never mentioned off the cuff. It is not just a bit of slang speech or normal speech. When you read the words new testament or new covenant. Something of an epoch is being discussed. You read things like blood of the New Testament, mediator of the New Testament, ministers of the New Testament. You know when you read these words you're not talking about something that is off in the periphery or on the edge. You're at the heart of God's eternal purpose when you're talking about the New Covenant. It's a central subject. So when we talk about the Covenant, we're not going to conjecture about it, philosophize about it. Because God's in it, he has elaborated very much about it. Now without further ado, I want to read the entire New Testament. And I'm going, because I, you might miss it the first time, I'm going to read it twice. I'm going to read the New Testament once from the Old Testament, as people call it. And now I read the New Testament from the New Testament, as people call it. People call it wrong, but that uh, first is found in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. And there's going to, throughout the days that follow, there's going to be exposition on this text. This shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Verse 33. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. I will do it. I will write it in their hearts. And will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother. Say, know the Lord. For they shall all know me. 
From the least of them, saith the Lord, unto the greatest, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now this text is given again in the 8th chapter of the book of Hebrews. As the Holy Spirit elaborates upon it, placing it in the context of Christ's ministry. Hebrews 8 verse 8. Finding fault with them, Israel, he saith, Behold, the days come when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued not in my covenant. And I regarded them not. I regarded them not. Saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. Write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God, they shall be to me a people. They shall no more teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest, and I will be merciful to their unrighteousnesses and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. What a text of scripture. The days come. The day come. And if I could speak to saintly Jeremiah now, who was on the other side, and if he is privy to our discussions, which methinks he is, I would like to tell him, Jeremiah, the days have come. What you said would come has come. And God has done what he said he'd do. And it is true, Jeremiah, that fewer people in the church speak about it than you did. But we will speak about it. A new covenant. What is the new covenant? <clears throat> well, I want to dispense with a few things. First of all, there is a lot of folklore that has surrounded the words New Testament and New Covenant in the church world, particularly the segment with which I am mostly familiar. So I'm going to first tell you five things is not dispensed with that. I'm going to go on further than that. Five things is not. The New Testament or the New Covenant is not the, first, the last 27 books of the Bible. Now that is a bit of thinking that has been forged on the anvil of human logic and has been perpetrated among men that when you say New Testament, Almost invariably, people think of the last 27 books of the Bible. Some people are so persuaded that this is the case, that that's the only part of the Bible they carry. They carry what they call a New Testament. When I was a young man, because it was highly embarrassing to be seen with a big Bible in some circles, they would get a little skinny, what they call New Testament, and put it in here so no one would guess they had a Bible. Well, that thing in their pocket was not the New Testament. Let's say for a moment, <clears throat> incidentally, I would like to announce to you, if you do not know, that every person that is born again carries the New Testament around within him all the time. He is a living epistle. <laughs> the New Testament is written in fleshly hearts, or hearts that are malleable, hearts that can grow, hearts that can change, Hearts that can see further than they did yesterday and do more than they did yesterday and understand more than they did yesterday. Can you imagine if the New Testament was the last 27 books of the Bible, Jesus saying this in Luke 22, 20, this is the cup of the New Testament, this is the cup of the last 27 books of the Bible, which is poured out for you for the remission of sins. I mean, it sounds absurd. Could you imagine... Uh, this being said of Jesus, Hebrews 9, 15, for this cause he is the mediator of the last 27 books of the Bible. See, it's obvious that's not what it is. The new covenant is not, emphatically is not, the last 27 books of the Bible. It's not a set of books like Romans through Jude or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John or some other set of books. It's not a compilation of writings, books. That's not what the New Testament or new covenant is. Let's say for a moment that that is what it is. 
That's a set of books, a manual, so to speak. Could you imagine God saying to Israel in Jeremiah 31, 31, Behold, the day is come when I'll make a new set of books for the house of Israel. Huh? This is not what it, the new covenant is. The new covenant cannot be comprehended academically. I have to be emphatic on this. It can only be comprehended spiritually because it is a spiritual covenant. It's not a moral code. The new covenant is not a set of new commandments that replace the old commandments. Jesus did not die to bring us a set of new commandments. A set of new commandments is not what we needed. When you think about the history of the human race, Adam and Eve had one commandment. Folks, that's all they had. One commandment. They didn't keep it. Now we advance some with Israel, they got ten commandments. Ten basic commandments. They didn't keep them. Folk, it ought to be evident. What we needed was not a new set of rules, what we needed was a new nature. Our natures were the fault was. Finding fault with them, he said. I will make a new covenant. So, just a modicum of thought will tell you that our deepest need was not a code, but a new nature, and the new covenant is not a new set of rules. Although there are rules associated with it, it itself is not a set of rules. It's, it's not an agreement between God and man. Now there are two sides to every covenant, how well I know it. But the side of man in the new covenant is radically different from the old covenant. Under the old covenant, and let me just read precisely the words that God gave, Le Leviticus 18 verse 5, Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live by them saith the Lord. That's the old covenant. That's the arrangement that was made. I'll tell you what to do. You do it. I'll accept you. Plain enough, huh? Well, they didn't do too well, nor has anyone before nor since at rule keeping. Even though no one here surely is against rules or would dare to say that you are ruleless with God. It's just a higher rule. We have a higher rule. Galatians 3, verse 10 through 12 says, As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Hmm? Not blessing, folk. Curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them, but that a man is justified by the, by the that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident. So if you can't see it, the problem is with you. It's evident. If you can ever get into your mind who God is and who you are and what God wants and what's demanded of you, it will become evident. I can't negotiate with God on the basis of a covenant that depends on my punctilious obedience. I'm going to have to have something beyond that. So the new covenant is not uh, an agreement between God and man. The basis of the new covenant is actually the basis. Now get me what I'm saying here. The basis of the new covenant is actually unilateral. In the new covenant, God said what he was going to do. He didn't say what you ought to do. He said what he was going to do. He didn't say what you might do. He said what God would do. It's providing a basis for association with man. It was unilateral, one-sided. Where our part comes in is in faith. The new covenant is the covenant that accentuates faith. And I'm going to affirm a little later that the new covenant was actually made between the Father and the Son. I'm going to make that affirmation. Lastly, the new covenant is not a liturgical system or a system of procedures and ways that you do things. Now, the first covenant was precisely that. The book of Hebrews tells us about the first covenant, that it was a covenant that stood in washings and diverse ordinances and procedures. That's what the new covenant, the old covenant was. The new covenant is not 
a list of procedures. Now, there are things to do. Make no mistake about it. There are things to do. But they're of a higher order. Now, compare this, Hebrews 10, 22, with the procedures that were under the first covenant. He said, let us draw near with a true heart having our conscience purged from dead works to serve the living God and our bodies washed with pure water. That's a different kind of a procedure. It's a spiritual procedure. It's a procedure of someone that has already accepted. So the new covenant is not a liturgical system that guarantees God will accept you because you do everything precisely the right way. What is the new covenant? It is primarily a declaration it is primarily an announcement, a proclamation. Now, we live in a time when affirmations are exceedingly rare. I am more and more being impressed with how very little people have to say that speak in the name of the Lord. It is time to take out of the pulpit people that don't have anything to say. Amen. People that don't have something to affirm. Something to declare, something to proclaim, something to announce, something to report. The new covenant is something that has announced. Notice this language. I will make. The covenant which I will make. I will put my laws within them. On their heart will I write them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. They shall not teach Again, they shall all know me. I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. See, it's a declaration. It's an affirmation. It's not laying out a procedure. It's not laying out what we should do. It's telling you what God's going to do. And believe me, there's power in this. Amen. I cannot get over the time when Ezekiel, God took him out to see a valley of dry bones. And when he saw it, it was an exceeding large valley. There were a lot of bones in it. They were very dry. And uh, God told him that it was all a house of Israel. He said, our hope is gone. Hopeless situation. Bleached, dry bones. And God said, son of man, how about these bones? Can they live? Now, he didn't check the uh, manual of the theological studies of the day on the possibilities of bones living. He just shot the right back to the Lord, sir. He said, you know. And God said, I want you to preach to these bones. Preach to them. Now, if it was a preacher of our time, he'd chastise the bones for being dry. He'd tell them, how come you're out here? How'd you get in this valley in the first place? And why haven't you done something about your condition? Bones should not be disassembled. Huh? Bones should have flesh upon them. You could go into a long diatribe. That's not what he said. All he told the bones, all he told the bones, all he told them was what God was going to do. You tell these bones... I'm going to put sinews and muscle and flesh on them. Tell them that. Tell these bones that I'm going to put breath in them. Tell them that. Tell these bones I'm going to raise them up. Tell them. Tell these bones I'm going to put them in their land. You tell them. And uh, Ezekiel started telling them. And as soon as he started telling them, there was a noise in the valley. I knew right away it wasn't one of our churches. It was a message of what God was going to do, but it had power. Let me tell you, Amen. if this new covenant we're talking about in this week is just told, if it's just told, if it's just announced and proclaimed, something will begin to happen. Because when you talk about what God's going to do, something of this magnitude, about God putting his law in our hearts and writing them in our minds and making us so we know him, and forgiving our iniquities, something will begin to happen Amen. among the constituents. Primarily a declaration. No device of man or strategy of the devil can alter or minimize the power of this proclamation. The gospel, which are in this case are the words of the covenant. See, the Ten Commandments were the words of the first covenant. That's what they were called. In Exodus, the 34th chapter, the words of the covenant. 
But the words of our covenant are good news. And it's the power of God unto salvation. The power of affirmation has been long underestimated. I uh, challenge you to become a soul stirrer by telling what God is going to do. Further, the covenant defined. The covenant is a way. It's a different kind of a way. It's not a way of life. I've heard people say, Christianity is a way of life. And the people applaud. Yes, yes, yes. Well, it's not a way of life. It's a way, but not a way. It's a living way. In fact, the new covenant is called in Hebrews 10, 20, a new and living way. It's new in that it's completely different from anything before it. It's a different kind, a different order, a different type. It's living because it gives and sustains spiritual life. It brings you into connection with God. And it maintains your connection with God. It makes you so God can work in you instead of on you. There is so much these days in religious television about God working on people. God says, I'm going to work in the people. I'm coming on the inside. I'm going to put my law inside so they'll think like me and act like me. It's a way. And it's a way because it, it has bridged the gap from here to there. It's a way, all the way to God. The new covenant is not a way to be good. It's not a way to be right. It's not a way to be powerful. It's a way to come to God. Amen. And if you don't come to God, if in the end you go to hell, what difference does it make what else you did? Amen. It's a way. New and living way. It's a way where we have access to God with confidence, Ephesians 3.12 says. That's something even Moses didn't have. Moses had access to God, but he feared and trembled. He said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Well, that's not the experience of those in the New Covenant. They say, I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I envy the sparrows and the swallows that can be with God. They do not fear and quake in God's presence. They rejoice at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. And who comes a way to God. It's an effective way. You become a son and an heir of God. Amen. It's a way of conforming you to the image of God's son. The new covenant is what God uses to make you like Christ. And if you aren't like Christ, you don't get in. Amen. You've got to be like Christ. Now you... Good land folk, if folk couldn't be like Moses on their own effort, how are you going to be like Jesus on your effort? You've got to have a better covenant that guarantees you'll be conformed to the image of his son. The new covenant guarantees that. In the new covenant, God takes us down to the potter's house. And he does something with us. You remember that uh, Jeremiah was taken down to the potter's house. got a little lesson it's found in Jeremiah 18, 2. Arise, go down to the potter's house. There I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again. He made it again, another vessel. Huh? So you dropped out the bottom, did you? So you failed, did you? You didn't major up, did you? The new covenant can put you on the potter's wheel. And he'll make you again, Amen. another vessel. What a better covenant it is. This is the covenant where God is fulfilling his purpose that he had before the world began. There on the trestle boards, of eternity, God determined to reconcile fallen people and not just to bring them back where Adam was, but to bring them up where Jesus is. And the new covenant's the way. That's how he's going to do it. Now the new covenant, technically speaking, this is technical, but it's true, was made technically with Christ. Our advantage of the covenant is strictly in proportion to our association with Christ. 
If you're not in Christ, you don't get any benefits of the covenant. If you are in Christ, you get all the benefits of the covenant. Yes, strictly was made with Christ. We can go back into old time when there was like a caucus between the eternal word and the Father. God had determined to have a race of people like himself. He had determined to extend himself, if you please, in humanity. To take his own nature and diffuse it into other personalities. I thought about how can you explain something like this, and I struck upon it some time back. You remember the widow that uh, her creditors were hounding her, and she came to the prophet and said, what, what can I do? He said, uh, what do you have in the house? She said, I have a little bit of oil. Not very much. He said, they want you to go to your neighbors and borrow vessels, not a few. Fill up the house with all kind of vessels. She went out there and she filled up the house with all kind of vessels. Got the house full. He said, start pouring. She poured in the first vessel, filled up. There wasn't any less oil in hers. Second vessels filled up. There still wasn't any less oil in hers. She filled every vessel in the whole house. And when she stopped filling, the oil stayed and it stopped. Just as much was in it when she ended as it was when she started. She extended the oil. I tell you, folk, there's going to be, because of the new covenant, an innumerable company of people out of every kindred and nation and tribe and tongue and people in the world, and God's no less God, and yet they're more like God. They're all partakers of the divine nature, and he hasn't lost one whit of his nature. Amen. He's extended himself, and the covenant, the covenant is how he does it. He made it with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the account. In Hebrews 10, verse 5, Jesus is speaking. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, as Jesus, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body as thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it's written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Now he's talking about the new covenant. He takes away the first. That's the first covenant. That he may establish the second. That's the new covenant. By the which will, still talking about the covenant, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. I mean, you've got to get the picture. What a glorious picture it is. Thousands of animals sacrificed to God. Rivers of blood flowed by the commandment of Almighty God. And God's statement about the whole sacrificial system was, that isn't what I wanted. It isn't what I wanted. It hasn't changed anybody. It hasn't reconciled anybody. Not one sin has been removed. No one's past has been eradicated. No one's future has been opened. I'm not pleased with this. And the son, knowing it was going to be at great personal expense, that he was going to have to take a lower seat for eternity, said, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll give you what you want. And then you'll be able to do what you desire. Amen. The covenant was made with Christ. It's as though God said, you go. You bear the indignation, my indignation. You take the stroke of my wrath. You let me curse you. You become sin. And I will strike you down. And I'll raise you again. Because if I strike down humanity, they can't come back. But you can. And if you do that, I will give you the heathen for your inheritance. That's where I got in. The covenant was made with Christ. Jesus so pleased God that God now pours out the blessing. God's happy about what Jesus did. If the world isn't happy, they just missed it. God's happy. Whoever comes to him through Christ will find an open arm 
and a glad heart and a blessing. Our participation, you see, is contingent upon Christ. The Amen. covenant was made with Christ. Well, as Categorica said that in Galatians 3.16, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says, not to seeds as of many, but as unto thy seed, which is one, which is Christ. That's who the promise is made to. Christ. So we are participants by means of our association with Christ. Now, a couple of other things here. The new covenant is an economy of wisdom. Now, there's never been an economy like this in God's dealings with man. An economy of wisdom. It is not an economy of authority. Now there, will, there are some of my colleagues, none of them are here, I hope. If they are, they'll be embarrassed. None of us uh, are against God's authority. But I will tell you, this is not a covenant of authority. It's not a covenant where you grovel before God and you'd better do what I say or you're going to go to hell. Although that is true. <laughs> That's true. That is true. Incidentally, for your own inquiry, the word lordship is in the Bible. But it is never in reference to Jesus. That's my affirmation. Now you search and see if I'm not true. It's never in reference to Jesus. The Gentiles exercise lordship, Jesus said. But it's a, it's a coercive lordship. Jesus is a beneficent lord. Amen. And lordship, this is a technical point. Lordship does not apply to Jesus because we are willing servants. Amen. We, have come under his, we have come under his wings. And the first question. People that hear the new covenant and believe it, the first question they ask is, what do you want us to do? Amen. Search through the book of Acts and see if it's not the case. What do you want us to do? You never heard Israel say that. The only time Israel would say something, they were under the chastening rod of God, being bitten by snakes or a plague, then they'd cry out. But that wasn't the case with us. We heard the good news and said, it's good enough for me. What do you want me to do? Amen. If you ask me to run through a troop, I will. And if you ask me to leap over a wall, I will. And if you ask me to be buried, I will. I will do what you ask. See, it's not a covenant of authority. It's a covenant of association, a wise covenant. The Word of God tells us that now, in this new covenant dispensation, if I may use that word, now to angels and principalities, principalities and powers in heavenly places, is being made known through the church, the manifold wisdom, the wisdom of God. According to his purpose, he has purposed in himself, the eternal purpose that he's purposed in himself. He's showing a great gallery of heavenly intelligences how wise he is. How is it that you are here today? How is it that you are in Christ today? It is his wisdom that has brought you. Amen. Like a Habakkuk 2.14 says, I will bring them into the wilderness. I'll lure them into the wilderness. Speak comfortably to them. And by his wisdom, without overriding your volitionary powers, without compromising his own deity, he brought you to the point where you wanted Christ. You actually wanted him. You wanted what God offered. Wisdom brought you that far. The new covenant is a covenant where wisdom is the premier thing. The Old Covenant had a matrix of commands with exacting procedures, but it left hearts unchanged. You could follow the procedure from beginning to end and go right into Jericho and steal a Babylonian garment and a wedge of silver and wedge of gold and pieces of silver. You could be like Israel, you could come out of Egypt with a high hand. You can experience miracles that are unequaled in magnitude in the history of the world before or after. You can see a waters of a sea part. You can see waters gush out of a rock. You can eat manna from heaven for 40 years and your shoes never wear out. You can see kings melt in your presence. And you can see the sun stand still for a day so you can finish the battle. But it didn't change anybody. 
God's law never was in their heart. It was not in their mind. That's why he had to enforce the Sabbath day. Take about three weeks, they'd have forgot all about God. But not so in the new covenant. Amen. It's a covenant of wisdom where he has accomplished all of these things by wise and discreet actions. Finally, it's a covenant of blessing. When the old covenant was instituted, Deuteronomy, the 27th chapter, they had some representatives stand on Mount Gerizim. Some other representatives stood on Mount Ebal. They told the people about the covenant. From Mount Gerizim, they shouted out the blessings. Then after the blessings were sounded, they shouted out the curses. Reuben and his group. But when you read that new covenant that I read for you two times, there was not a breath of a curse in it. No curses were in it. It was a covenant of blessing from stem to stern, from beginning to end. Oh, to be sure there are curses, I understand that, but the curses are not in the covenant. The curses are because the people that rejected the testator of the covenant. Amen. Because the one who ratified the covenant was rejected. But the covenant doesn't curse you. The covenant blesses you. Amen. And if you're cursed, you'll be cursed by God. Because you didn't take advantage of his covenant. It's a covenant of blessing. I tell you, when... When you come into the new covenant, it's just like when the temple of God was built, the sound of an axe or hammer wasn't heard. <laughs> the curses are the sound of the axe and the hammer. Chip anyway. When you come into the covenant and the law is written on your heart and you say, if you say, seek ye my face, thy face, O God, will I seek. Amen. Covenant of blessing. Paul saw this and he outstripped all his fellows. He labored more abundantly than they, we're talking about the 12 apostles, than they all. When he saw this, he said, the things that were gained to me, I counted them but dung. I discarded them. So I could win Christ. You get Christ, you get everything the covenant has. Everything it has. You get Christ, you get it written a law on your heart. You get it put into your mind so you think like God. Now, God isn't going to put the book of Romans in your mind without you reading it. I mean, I understand that. But, I, but when you read it, it'll stay there. And you'll say, you know, I see it. Paul saw it and he counted everything lost. He wanted to know him. He wanted to know the power of his, uh, his resurrection. He wanted to know the fellowship of his sufferings. He wanted to be made conformable to his death. He wanted the resurrection to be a plus. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. I'm telling you that that's all covenantal blessing. The new covenant is what accomplished all of that. Now, Amen. this in closing. The scripture says, with, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And that has thrown some people off. <clears throat> of course, there were, all the promises applied to Israel. All of them did. Romans 9 tells you that all the promise, all the covenants, all the giving, the glory, the service, it all belonged to them. But I'm going to confirm to you that this covenant that we're talking about that was made to the house of Israel is the covenant you are in under in Christ. It is the covenant Jesus is presently administering. In Hebrews the 8th chapter, that's he requotes Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. He quotes this passage. After those days, saith the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Judah, with the house of Israel. I'll put my law in their heart, I'll write it in their minds, they'll be my people, I'll be their God, they'll no more save a man to his neighbor, know the Lord, they'll all know me from the least to the greatest, for I'll be merciful to their unrighteousnesses and their sins and iniquities, will I remember no more. With Israel and with Judah. But he, preceding that in Hebrews 8, he talks about the one who's mediating this covenant, and he says, Christ is our high priest, Hebrews 8, verse 1. Hebrews 8, 6 says, he now has obtained a more excellent ministry and is a mediator of a better covenant. Now, he's talking about this covenant. It was made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, continuing, talking about Christ in regard to this covenant we just read about, he said, he has obtained eternal redemption for us, what is, in fact, the institution of the new covenant is what made the first one old. 
It wasn't old in Moses' day. <laughs> Moses didn't institute an old covenant. It became old the day Jesus started mediating the new one. It became old. Now, what is the answer to all of that? Well, you know it. Those of you that are familiar with the things of God know it. Like wild olive branches spoke, we have been grafted into the natural olive tree. <laughs> We're partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. And the root and the fatness of the olive tree, when you boil it down to its essence, is the new covenant. That's what it is. A covenant of blessing. So, having been grafted into them, we partake of this premier promise, the new covenant. The new covenant is divine. We see divine activity versus human activity. 2,500 years up to Moses, we had man working on his own. That's ample time, I would think. That's ample time to develop some premier leader that could lead us out of the morass of sin. I'd say 2,500 years is adequate time. Nobody surfaced. Then 1,500 years, we were under the administration of law. If it was just that we lacked data, we just lacked information. Maybe that was it. We got a lot of information in the law and we still didn't measure up. So God said, I looked. For four millennia I looked. I sought for a man that stand in the gap. I looked for someone who'd be an intercessor. I tried to find someone that would resolve the dilemma. So now I'll bring salvation myself. Amen. That's what the new covenant is. It is the announcement that the salvation has been brought. It's a divine accomplishment. Let us have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the new covenant. After we as a human race had done so miserably, we rejoice that you have done so wonderfully. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen, that was very good. Amen. This time we're going to have a couple of testimonies. The first...